Good morning, everybody. Oh my goodness, I am so, so happy to be with you. I am Eris Winger, and I have the privilege and honor, so many this morning. The first is that I have the privilege and honor of being the executive director of the National Association of Mathematicians. I also have the privilege of, can you hear me? I have the, also had the privilege of being overbooked at this very moment. So I was running a mini course with Abby Herzig and Michael Dorf on being a Jedi, and I was thrilled to walk out of that to actually live in the presence of an incredible Jedi that we have here that is about to speak to you. Dr. Ron Buckmeyer is a professor of mathematics at Occidental College in Los Angeles, California. Ron holds mathematics degrees, the PhD, master's, and bachelor's from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He was associate dean for curricular affairs and director of the core program from 2018 to 2022. He was an employee of the National Science Foundation from 2011 to 2013 and 2016 to 2018. In 2023, he was recognized as a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, SIAM. His primary research interests are numerical analysis, scholarship of teaching and learning, mathematical modeling, and most recently, the area of data science, focusing on its intersections with social justice. He's a passionate advocate for broadening the participation of historically excluded groups, especially LGBTQ plus individuals and racial and ethnic minorities in math and in other STEM disciplines. He serves the broader mathematics community in several capacities, such as Vice President for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at SIAM, Chair of the AMS Board of Trustees, I'm sorry, a committee, a Chair of the AMS Committee on EDI, Chair of MSRI's uh, HRAC, member of BR, BIRS's EDI Board, and ISERM's Board of Trustees. He is a co-founder and board member of Spectra, the Association of LGBTQ plus mathematicians and their allies. He has well over 35 years of experience as an LGBT rights activist serving on the boards of organizations such as Equality California, the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, now Outright International, and the Center for Health Justice. At this moment, at this time, in this place, I can think of no better person to hear for, from than our 2023 Nam David Harold Blackwood lecturer, then Dr. Ron Buckmeyer. Okay. All right, thanks, Eris. Um, it's a hard act to follow to come after Jenny Quinn, so this is going to be tough. Got to raise energy. Um, OK, uh, let's, let's do this. So the title of my talk is Different Differences. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll get to there in a second. OK, so if you are just, this is a gate check announcement. <laughs> if you're, if you're in this, in, for this talk, this is what the advertisement looks like, going for different differences. If not, sort of proceed with caution to the exits, and <laughs> you can go to another talk. I want to start, typically these talks start with uh, a land acknowledgement, and I'm gonna call this a Florida acknowledgement. Um, and so first I'd like, like to acknowledge that Florida has enacted legislation that targets, terrorizes, and torments members of the LGBT community like myself. Um, Florida has explicitly diluted the voting power of black and Latino communities. Florida has explicitly endorsed educational practices and curricula that bolster white supremacy and promote compulsory heterosexuality. Florida has endangered many lives by enacting nonsensical gun laws and anti-scientific policies related to COVID and vaccines in general. Florida has enacted legislation that diminishes women's personhood, bodily autonomy, and constitutional rights. And Florida has declared its opposition to equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as awareness of social justice in academia and other settings. Uh, if you want to see them more cl clearly, there they are. Um, yeah. So that's my acknowledgement that we are in Florida, <laughs> and this is what that means. OK, so on to different differences. This talk will be split into three parts. Um, we'll start about half the time will be about uh, different differences 
a mathematical presentation. Uh, there'll be a short primer on approximating derivatives, um, no knowledge beyond maybe the beginning of Calculus 1 required. Um, I'll talk about um, non-standard finite difference schemes, often known as NSFD schemes. I will use this opportunity to brag about my students and recent research results. Um, that's the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk will be uh, discussing different kinds of differences embodied in myself. And there I'll be talking about um, uh, visible and invisible uh, parts of my identity. And um, I refer to those as sort of standard and non-standard differences. And I'll talk about how um, those different differences may or may not have perturbed my academic uh, trajectory uh, uh, through my career. And then lastly, I'll end with how different differences intersects with the mathematics community itself, um, uh, provide some uh, data and information about who does the math, and um, hopefully end with some uh, encouraging words about uh, a different future. Okay. So, different differences, part one, mathematics. So, a short primer on approximating derivatives. Um, uh, I've been on a year-long sabbatical, and I um, got to the stage of acceptance. In a few weeks, I will be in the classroom, and I'll be, I'll be talking about <laughs> derivatives, um, and as many of us will be doing soon. And so, we know that you can approximate a derivative using uh, all sorts of difference formulas. The standard one is the forward difference formula, uh, you can also have a backward difference formula and the center difference formula. Um, and so what is, what is this that we're actually doing? So we have a curve, y equals f of x, um, that's continuous. Uh, we are going to approximate. This, this function is defined on some interval from uh, a to b. Uh, we we want to uh, do an equipart equipartition. So um, uh, split into n intervals, h is the separation, so it's b minus a over n. And then we are going to um, approximate the function f of x at the x sub k's, and we'll call those things u sub k's. Those are discrete function values. And uh, this is a sort of beginning of a, of a process when we're trying to solve a differential equation. We may not actually know f of x. Uh, we're going to be approximating it by u sub k. And the hope, the hope is that as n gets larger and larger, maybe to infinity, um, then the discrete partition will be exactly the same as the uh, continuous interval. Okay, so things should get better as n gets larger. Okay, and now that we have um, defined uh, the discrete function values, the u sub k's, let me go back, uh, just note, will be u sub k will be f at x sub k, u sub k plus one will be f at x k plus one, which is f at x, sort of one interval over, and u sub k minus one is f of x k minus one, et cetera. So now that we have these function values defined, we can produce discrete analogs of the uh, regular difference quotients, which we'll call the discrete standard finite differences. And again, I'll run through those. Um, the discrete, you have a discrete forward difference, you have a discrete backward difference, you have a discrete center difference. Okay. And these are what we're going to call standard difference formulas. Um, and we use those to approximate derivatives and differential equations to produce difference equations. Um, so here, we're going to do an example. Um, here's an initial value problem. Um, this differential equation has long stumped um, mathematical experts. What kind of uh, function would dy dx equals y, y of zero equals one. What kind of function? Often I, when I um, teach uh, differential equations, I'll refer to, so there's a, there's a mystery function y, and um, instead of calling it y, I'll call it um, starburst. So starburst has this property that when you differentiate starburst, you get starburst as a result. So what kind of, and when you plug in zero into this star, mysterious starburst, starburst function, um, it outputs one. And so I often call the answer um, uh, the calculus student's favorite function because we know that starburst actually has a real name and it's the exponential function. The function which when differentiated gives you itself is e to the x. And we know that when x equals zero, um, e to the zero is one. So we, we know the exact solution to this initial value problem um, is y of x equals e to the x. 
we could, we also know that the discrete version of that differential, of that function, uh, y of x equals e to the x on our interval um, is y sub k equals e to the x sub k. Um, and so if we, we, in this particular case, right, uh, we, before we had um, a was zero, b, uh, b was some unknown value, we're gonna say b is one, a is zero, so h is just one over n. And so what's happening here is that we're going to uh, this little test problem, uh, we're going to discretize it, discretize the initial value problem, and um, using standard finite differences, and so we're going to convert this initial value problem, or differential equation, um, into a difference equation. And that's really useful, uh, because uh, when, you're, when you have differential equations and you want to solve, solve it, the inverse operation that you're doing is integration. And as we'll be teaching our students in, in um, I guess, a few months from now, integration is a relatively difficult um, operation. But when you've converted the differential equation into a difference equation, the inverse operation you're doing there is really just solving an algebraic equation. And so in this example, we're using the discrete, um, the, sorry, the forward discrete uh, difference. So y, dy dx has been converted into y sub k plus 1 minus y sub k over h, and the y just becomes y sub k. And the initial condition y of 0 equals 1 uh, becomes just y sub 0 equals 1. It's just, just a particular value. And um, show some details. Uh, when you, you rearrange that equation, you get y sub k plus 1 equals y sub k times 1 plus h. That's known as a recurrence relation, so that we can use that um, if, if we know y sub 0, we can get y sub 1, because when, um, uh, when k equals 0, y sub 1 is y sub 0 times 1 plus h. Great. And when k equals 1, y sub 2 is y 1 times 1 plus h. And this is how you, we use a recurrence relation. Um, what we want to get is the explicit formula for y sub k in terms of k. And that result is that y sub k equals 1 plus h to the k. And we know that for all the k values uh, from 0 to n. And so, those, so that is the exact solution to the uh, difference equation. So that was the exact solution to a approximate version of the differential equation. And uh, close observers may have noticed that that is not the same thing as the um, discrete version of the ex of this exact solution to the ordinary differential equation. So presumably, we could graph these, these two objects and see what happens. So, What's happening is that the exact solution, um, uh, right, y of the starburst, or um, the exponential function, is the red curve. And um, the blue circles are the discrete values of uh, our solution to the difference equation. And we just, we just let n equals 10. And so what we want to happen is we want, as we um, increase n, as we get more blue circles, we want the blue circles to approach the red line. Uh, we want the difference between the solution to the difference equation and the solution to the differential equation at those values to go to zero. Okay. So how accurate was, that, was our solution? We can work out the error. The error is just going to be the difference between the um, solution to the differential equation, known as an ODE, and the solution to the difference equation, which I call an O delta E. Um, and remember, the solution to the differential equation was in red. That's y sub k equals e to the kh. That's its discrete analog. And the solution to the difference equation was 1 plus h to the k. Take the absolute difference. We get a, what's called the pointwise error, e epsilon sub k at any point, And we get this expression. Uh, we can hopefully, let's see get a graph showing this for different n values. So there's the n equals 10, 20, um, 40, 100. As n gets larger and larger, the difference, we want those, the, the number of dots, um, as they increase, we want them to get closer and closer to the origin, because that's showing us that our error is getting smaller and smaller. And as n goes to infinity, uh, you should just get a line uh, on the um, x-axis. OK, so that's how. As n increases and h decreases, your error should be decreasing as well. Okay. And so this is the, what we've been doing, is that we've, we start with the ODE, and we approximate it discreetly. When we approximate it discreetly, so we're going from left to right, uh, it turns into a difference equation, which we call an O delta E. And then for um, these kinds of 
toy problems, we can solve each of those exactly. When we solved the difference equation on the right, we produced the blue dots, which are given by y sub k. When we solved the ODE, we solved it, we integrated, uh, we got the, the function y sub x, we approximate that discreetly, because remember, we're only, um, we're only defined on the discrete interval, on those, on those endpoints at the k places. And the whole point of um, the numerical solution of ODEs is to try to make the red y of x of k and the blue y of k get as close together as possible to make the sort of green approximation to be smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. Um, so let, and th this is w what we just did, we did with standard um, finite differences. Let's see what happens if we do use different differences. So Professor Ron Mickens of Clark Atlanta University has suggested um, using a different way to approximate the derivative. And he, he interposes two new functions, phi sub one and phi sub two of h. Uh, the, phi's, the phi's have this property that they're big O of h, or when you're pro when, as h goes to zero, um, their first, first order term is just gonna look like h. Uh, there's a discrete analog of the um, Mickens difference which looks like uh, dy dx is y sub k plus one minus c sub y sub c times y sub k over again a phi sub h. Um, in most cases, we can sort of ignore c and just let it be one. And what we're really focused on is the phi of h function in the denominator. It's called a denominator function. Um, these differences, um, which uh, Professor Mickens uh, introduced in the late 70s, early 80s, we now call them non-standard finite differences or NSFD schemes, or I've been trying to popularize the term Mickens differences. Um, okay, and so what's very, what's the beauty and power of the NSFD schemes is that uh, because you have this flexibility of choosing a denominator function, you can uh, use information or insight or intuition about the structure of the ordinary differential equation to um, let you know what kind of denominator function you want to choose. And, and you're only restricted that these denominator functions, as I said, have to be big O of h as h goes to zero. And so, right, if the denominator function was just h, that's standard um, uh, finite differences. But all these other functions have this behavior, sine of h, 1 minus e to minus h over h, et cetera, h, 1 minus h, all these functions. So we're going to now do our example one again uh, using non-standard uh, finite differences. So I go th I'm going to go through this a little faster. Um, again, y prime equals y, y of 0 equals 1. This time, the, our choice for denominator function will be e to the h minus 1. And you, you can ask yourself, why do we pick that? Well, we sort of knew from our experience with Starburst that this initial value problem has an exponential in it. But we, can, we couldn't just pick e to the h because we know that as h goes to 0, e to the h goes to 1. So that's why the choice, e to the h minus 1. Go through the same process. In the, solving the difference equation becomes doing algebra. We get an expression. Uh, a, a recurrence relation, again, for y sub k plus 1 is y sub k plus 1 equals e to the h times y sub k. Um, we do, again, a little math with the recurrence relation. k equals 0, so y1 is y0 times e to the h, but we know y0 is 1. So y1 is e to the h. We know y sub 2 is uh, y1 times e to the h, but y1 is e to the h, so we have e to the h times e to the h, so it's e to the 2h. So when k equals 1, it's e to the 2h. When k equals 2, um, you get e to the 3h. So y sub 3 is e to the 3h. y sub 2 is e to the 2h. Clearly, y sub k equals e to the kh. And here, your spidey sense should be tingling um, because this should look familiar when we looked at the exact solution to the, uh, the initial IVP and we discretized it. It looks something like this, and yes, your spidey sense is correct. Um, if you look at the uh, pointwise error again, right, the difference between the exact solution approximated or disc discretized at x of k and the um, exact solution to the, differ to the difference equation, y sub k, right, sort of the blue dots and the red circle, I'm sorry, the red line, the red curve, um, right, previously when we did a standard difference, the difference equation's uh, explicit solution was y sub k equals 1 plus h to the k. When we did the Mickens difference, the solution of that difference equation was y sub k equals e to the kh. 
And if you just, if you do the error this time, you get it is always zero, um, which is amazing. Uh, because usually when you do numerical differential equations, uh, you have some kind of error that you're trying to get rid of. And so, as I mentioned before, the, one of the um, amazing aspects of uh, NSFD schemes is that you can actually produce exact finite difference schemes. And I'm sure here your um, any skeptic in the room would be saying, well, you clearly just, you know, one, this is not a really hard problem. Um, uh, two, <laughs> um, you clearly chose your denominator function um, to, uh, to sort of have this happen. So, but uh, I am making the claim that this is, this is not a fluke. Ron Mickens has um, found exact finite difference schemes for all sorts of um, ODEs and PDEs. And what, while we often start by looking at uh, very simple um, uh, differential equations, that's to give us insight into what kind of denominator functions or what kind of non-standard finite difference schemes you might want to use in more complicated situations. And right, so there's an entire field of numerical analysis built out of these ideas of different differences. Um, so here's a, a picture of a different Ron, Ron Mickens, that is the man himself, um, celebrated his 80th birthday uh, this year, which was a, a blast uh, at Clark Atlanta. Um, he's considered the father of non-standard finite difference, non-standard finite discretization. Um, he will tell you very clearly he is not a mathematician. <laughs> he used PhD is in physics, um, but he has well over 300 published papers um, uh, in mathematics journals um, on uh, solving ordinary differential equations, nonlinear oscillations, um, and 12 books. And uh, there's a little asterisk there because he, his latest book came out last year, and I'm sure there's, by the time I've finished speaking, he might have published another paper. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't stop. Okay, so I think, um, oh yes, I, now I get to brag about, um, oh, not, not yet. Um, I want to convince you that NSFD schemes can be used for uh, non-trivial problems as well. And so I've been using um, NSFD schemes um, in many different situations. Um, here's something called the planar Bratu problem, so it doesn't just have to be first order differential equations. Uh, the Bratu problem is a famous problem from the 70s. It involves a, a very nonlinear, um, uh, eigenvalue problem that bifurcates at a particular value and sort of being able to, it's a, it's a boundary value problem instead, being able to sort of uh, resolve where the bifurcation goes from two solutions to one solutions is sort of a, a benchmark for numerical um, uh, solutions of that differential equation. Um, then I looked at the cylindrical bratu gelfand problem, which is basically the same thing except in cylindrical coordinates, has the same um, bifurcation um, properties. And again, I, I came up with a, NSFD scheme that uh, did better at solving that than um, standard finite differences. Um, some more examples. D these NSFD schemes, as I said, can be applied to um, partial differential equations. Um, that's my only paper with uh, Ron Mickens and uh, McMurtry, uh, was an undergraduate student at Occidental College. Um, and way back when, scary to think of, almost 30 years ago, uh, my PhD thesis, um, I came up with a um, improved numerical, uh, sort of what, what I now know was a non-standard finite difference, and um, I brought it to my advisor, and he said, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting, and I thought I had created this sort of brand new, um, you know, branch of mathematics, and then um, a good friend of mine, uh, Tom Motelsky at, um, at Duke, um, sort of because remember, this is before the internet. I mean, sorry, before, the, before Google, before you could sort of find out about people. But Tom said, have you heard of this guy called Ron Mickens? Um, because this was in the 90s. Ron had probably already published 100 papers on uh, non-standard finite differences by that time. And I was so amazed, because there was no Google, to find out there was another black mathematician named Ron who was doing <laughs> numerical analysis. Um, and so we um, got to be very good friends. Ron is, Ron is great. Um, and yeah, so that was that, that there was someone like me who uh, was doing this work sort of allowed me to sort of expand my aspirations of what could be done um, in this field. Okay, so now I can brag about my students. Um, uh, in summer 21, uh, we did an REU. We had some students from, this was, this was funded by NSF, um, and they looked at uh, constant coefficient Bernoulli ODEs. There was a known exact NSFD scheme um, 
And if you think about it, there's a whole bunch of very simple um, order differential equations, like um, even the one we actually really looked at, dy, dy dx equals uh, y, is really an example of a constant coefficient Bernoulli differential equation. So we sort of walk them through these different kinds of um, Bernoulli differential equations, and eventually they got to um, the generalized uh, constant coefficient Bernoulli differential equation when the, the uh, power, p, is just a um, rational number. And they use what we call a, a unity approximation. So you see there's a, a red one there, and so again, there's a, a phi of h, you have to pick a denominator function, and um, by uh, introducing this one and introducing uh, interesting functional arrangements, you can sort of use the idea of what's called a non-local discretization. It's, it's another kind of uh, non-standard finite difference equation that not only involves denominator functions, there's, there's many other ways you can sort of be non-standard. And um, so that um, sort of complicated looking expression in red is re both of them are really just fancy ways of writing one. Um, but because they're written in such a way, um, you, and using that specific uh, phi sub h, that is what the students showed is that you could use this, an NSFD unity approximation to um, re sort of reproduce um, the uh, exact standard, uh, exact NSFD scheme uh, for um, the constant coefficient BDEs. Okay, I'm gonna do that a little, a little faster. Um, last summer, we did another um, REU, and the students um, looked at um, uh, nonlinear order differential equations of the form u prime equals minus u cubed plus f of u, um, and uh, where f was a certain uh, sort of uh, polynomials. And what they did, again, they uh, used the unity approximation. Um, they call it cubic averaging. Um, and uh, what you're doing is that you're getting expression, right? Again, it's a discrete forward difference on the left and on the right, um, sort of fancy versions of one. And so you, what you have here is this is not, um, again, like before when you had the difference equation and you wanted to solve for y sub k plus one, here you want to solve for uk plus one, but it's a cubic. What do students do with cubics? They stick it into Wolfram Alpha. Um, and so you get this expression for the explicit, that's a little more complicated than y sub k equals y sub k times one plus h. Um, uh, but it works. The students compared their um, NSFD scheme using this to uh, many that are found in the literature, and their scheme is sort of the, the green one, and those are, those, that's the error, and so their error is at least as good, um, better than most of those, um, most of those schemes that are out there. Okay, so that's the end of um, the math part. I'm going to talk about um, how different differences um, intersects with myself. Um, and as I said before, um, you know, my identity consists of both standard differences, um, like race and gender that are visible, if you just see me down the street or on the stage, and non-standard identity characteristics like my ethnicity, my sexual orientation, my gender identity, immigration status, first generation status, class, marital status, um, you know, language ability. Um, and so my standard um, identity characteristics are you know, black or African American, male, and then my uh, non-standard identity characteristics, right? You might not know, I'm Caribbean. I'm wearing a, you know, sky blue linen suit in Tampa, so I'm very gay. Um, gender identity is male. I'm a naturalized US citizen. You, could, you might not have known that. You could, might not hear my sort of, uh, my, my thick Caribbean accent. Um, and I'm not first gen, my dad has a PhD in food science and nutrition, and class, well, all I'll say is that I have a mortgage in Los Angeles. Um, okay, um, so this section of the talk, I'll be talking about um, my career trajectory and sort of going through how those identity characteristics may or may not have sort of influenced or perturbed um, that trajectory. So let's go. Um, so again, I was born in Grenada, uh, which is in uh, the Caribbean, sort of near-ish to Venezuela. Before I was age two, moved to the United States. Um, interestingly, my father did not want us going to high school in the United States, so we went to Barbados, uh, where I uh, went to uh, the Cumbermere School. The Cumbermere School um, is, uh, we were, is very, it's, it's more British than the British. It was, you know, founded before the United States was a country in 1695. Uh, we wore a tie every day. 
when I graduated from the Cumberbatch School, I went directly to RPI in Troy, New York. While I was at um, RPI, uh, I co-founded something called Homo Radio at WRPI 91.5 FM, Troy, New York. Still on the air 20-something years later, Sundays from 12 to 2. Um, also, when I was um, at RPI, beginning graduate school, I created something called the Queer Resources Directory, still available at qrd.org, and um, that was intended to be, don't laugh, in 1991, it was intended to be the one place on the internet where all information related to GLBT, LGBT people could be found. Um, this was something that was in the water at the time. Uh, some of the people that uh, we used to work with uh, created something called yet another hierarchically organized oracle, which you may know now as Yahoo. Um, and so this idea that you could organize all the information on the internet was a thing that people were trying to do. This is well before any web browser existed. You had to access the internet through text-based things. So that's one thing I did. Um, I graduated from RPI, became a minority postdoctoral scholar in, Ox scholar in residence at Occidental um, in, in 94. 96, became assistant professor at Occidental College. Um, the QRD actually was a successful co-plaintiff in a, a US Supreme Court case, which um, unless there's some legal scholars in the room, you may not recognize ACLU versus Reno, um, but uh, what it's known for is that the Supreme Court struck down um, the Communications Decency Act of 1996 in a 7-2 decision, ruling that Congress could not pass a law um, regulating the display of um, excretory or sexual organs on the internet. Um, since they did that, of course, that never appears on the internet anymore. Um, but, so, um, but anyway, that's a little piece of my claim to fame. Um, 1999, I became a legal U.S. permanent resident. 2004, got tenure, became a U.S. citizen. Um, then later became, a chair, became the chair of the math department at Occidental College. I founded a nonprofit called the Robert Jordan Baird Rustin Coalition. It's a local black LGBT advocacy organization in Los Angeles. Um, I won an award from the National Organization of Gay, Lesbian, Scientists, and Technical Professionals. Uh, in 2011, did my first stint at the National Science Foundation, came back to Oxy, uh, got promoted, came a chair again. Um, went back to the National Science Foundation in 2016 as a permanent program officer, um, and then was an assistant dean. And so I'm, and then since then, since COVID-ish times, I've been, um, active, I guess, in the equity, diversity, and inclusion space at AMS, at MSRI, um, at SIAM. Um, and then this year, I was elected a SIAM fellow. I think I'm the first openly gay fellow, and I know I'm the fourth um, uh, black SIAM fellow after Trishette Jackson, number one, and then my good friends, uh, Jim Curry and Abba Gumel uh, two years ago, and then there's me. I'm hoping that if, even if I'm the first and the fourth, I will not be the last in either of those categories as Siam Fellows. Um, and so, as you can see, you know, this may be a standard or non standard career trajectory in academia, and sort of how sort of my identities have, um, I think, opened opportunities and also sort of. Um, um, made certain activities um, more um, salient to what I wanted to work on while I was also sort of, you know, doing research, uh, thinking about math, publishing papers, uh, doing service. Um, okay, so I think this is the end of the different differences. That's me. I'm going to, oh, yes, as I thought, um, I have uh, lots of time left, and so we can take some time on this uh, different differences and the math community. Okay. What is math? Who are we? Uh, there are many ways difference manifests in the mathematics community. Um, there are different ways on how different individuals who have different identity characteristics are allowed to participate in the math community, that how they participate or how they are allowed to participate in the math community. But what I want to um, uh, focus on are sort of uh, three main beliefs I have about the math community or math in general. Uh, the first one is math is a human endeavor. Um, I believe that math is created, discovered, learned, taught, researched 
by humans. So no matter where you are on the Platonist debate, is math created or discovered? Doesn't matter, it's still humans doing it. Uh, so either you're, even if it's created or discovered, math is a human endeavor, math is done by humans. Um, and math is for human flourishing. Shout out to Francis. Um, and math is for solving problems. Um, I'm an applied mathematician. I'm interested in using math to solve problems that, is, that are either sourced from or have applications to the real world. But um, if you are interested in math for solving problems um, that is um, not related to the real world, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, it's perfectly fine. Um, and so what th th these three ideas leads to the question, who does math? Who does the math? I believe since math is a human endeavor, math is intended to um, uh, enrich our artistic, creative um, uh, selves, and math is intended to contribute to society, it's really important who are those humans that are doing the math, and what are their standard and non-standard identity characteristics. Um, so here's some information, hopefully that's readable. Um, this is from uh, a, a, um, a book that I co-edited with Jessica Libertini called Improving Applied Mathematics Education. And here um, I sort of collected some data about, this is US citizen female mathematics PhD re recipients from 2004 to 2017. This was inspired by um, uh, some work that Nicole Josephs had done, Nicole Josephs of Vanderbilt University, um, had done, and I like to sort of uh, dwell on these numbers because these are not percentages. These are finite numbers of people. So for example, black, female, US citizen, PhD recipients. You can see in 2004, there was one. Okay, and never has there been, or I, I'm sorry, which is one year, I don't know. I don't know what was in the water in 2009, um, but uh, there's, there's only been one year where there's been more than a dozen um, uh, black women receiving PhDs. Right? Like for some of these years, like I know these people, right? You know these people. Some of these people might be in this room right now. Um, here's the data for um, black men and Latino men and um, um, everyone else. Um, and again, so when people talk about um, broadening participation and diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and sort of underrepresentation, um, I want to impress upon you how sort of profound um, that underrepresentation is. Um, these are the facts, this is the data, um, and I am currently working on projects to try to. Um, raise up, highlight, reify, promote the notion that um, we in the mathematics community should um, spend more energy thinking about and analyzing the mathematics community itself. Um, I'm calling that project MetaMath, using math and data science to analyze the math and data science community. Uh, so here's some more examples. Um, here's uh, mathematics bachelor's degrees. Um, What's interesting here is just sort of the trend, um, and, you, and you might be thinking, oh, this is not so bad. It's only about 57% of bachelor's degrees are um, by people who are identified as male. Um, but then you have to remember the context. The at, uh, people who get bachelor's degrees nationwide, um, a significant majority of, of them are women. So mathematics is, has a severe underrepresentation based on gender um, in bachelor's degrees. Um, and similar, here's, here's a trend. And uh, the other thing about that trend is that there's not much change. It's been 57 plus or minus, uh, you know, 42 plus or minus for the, the time of the, that data is available. And, and data is often not very available or, or not available um, very, um, uh, uh, recently, they're not very good recent data. Okay, so trend pretty straight um, in uh, bachelor degrees and gender. Here's bachelor degrees, race and ethnicity. Um, here, not unsurprisingly, because of the change in demographics um, in the United States, that um, uh, underrepresented uh, students um, from um, um, uh, minor, min racial and ethnic minorities are increasing 
relatively slowly um, in the number of bachelor degrees um, over time. And the next one is, oh yes. So he, here is um, data from a uh, recently uh, submitted paper. Um, and this looks, it uses available data, from a, a very large data set, um, from a paper that came out in, in Nature uh, last year by Wattman et al. They have data for 300,000 uh, faculty members at PhD granting institutions in the United States from 2011 th to 2020. And so in all disciplines, um, all PhD granting departments. Um, and you can see the blue line is the percentage of, um, and again, this data only includes standard differences, it does not include non-standard differences. Um, and, it, and it actually doesn't even include all standard differences because race and ethnicity is not in there. Um, so what we can see, the blue line represents all academia. Um, that was, yeah, some, uh, right, that's all the 300,000 faculty. Of, of the people who are in categories that we identified as mathematical sciences, that is math, operations, research, or statistics, departments that offer PhDs in those areas, uh, that was about 10,000 faculty. Um, here are the percentages. This is not great. If you look, so the orange line is what we call mathematics. The average over, those, that, over that 10 year period is 16.8%. Um, that's the, from 2011 to 2020, the percentage of women in, P in departments in the United States that grant PhDs in mathematics was 16.8%. That's a problem, I believe. Um, and so, who does the math? Who gets allowed to teach the math? Um, who do students see doing math? These are all influenced by um, this data, these differences that I've been showing you. Um, so I said, we do the math. Um, what I want to argue for is that, um, one, data about standard differences, race and gender, should be collected by and distributed widely to the mathematics community, and I would say on a timely fashion. I understand collecting the data is difficult and, and it's a whole process, um, but um, we can't do a good or let's say better job of trying to broaden participation in mathematics if we don't know where we are or have a common understanding of um, what this looks like. Um, okay, so also data about non-standard differences, sexual orientation, ethnicity, first generation status, et cetera, should also be collected um, and distributed widely to the mathematics community. I wanna give a sort of a positive shout out to AMS, American Mathematical Society, who since I believe 2020, um, has made um, available in your membership profile that you can um, articulate whether you're a member of the LGBTQ community or not. That's one of my goals as vice president for EDI at SIAM to also um, make that a, a, sta a standard operation. Um, these non-standard differences um, should be collected. First generation status, ethnicity, et cetera. Okay, but I want to, um, and on a hopeful note, um, we've been talking about JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and so I had to. Right, okay. <laughs> um, so, a, a new hope. Um, and this is sort of post-2020. Um, right, in 2020, AMS um, uh, created a, a fellowship to support a, a research mathematician, um, and it's one of those sort of uh, classic $50,000 uh, Claytor Gilmer Fellowship, um, NSF created the program Racial Equity in STEM Education um, in 2020, and there is an active um, solicitation in that area. You can just Google NSF 22-634, and that'll get you to, to the solicitation. Um, 2021, Sam named me uh, VP for EDI. I was the f um, first person in sort of leadership to be devoted towards EDI. Um, at a uh, math, math association. Uh, CBMS, that was a big deal, issued a st uh, joint statement on DEI in 2021 as well. Um, so that's CBMS, Conference Board of the Mathematical Sciences, is, is sort of an a organization of organizations of, of the math, math community. Um, 
for the first time in 25 years, AMS created a pol new policy committee and it was devoted to EDI. Um, as I said earlier, I became the first chair. Siam created a, a partnership with Mathematically Gifted in Black um, uh, that creates early, an early career fellowship program. Um, so th so there's, there's stuff happening in this space that is addressing uh, different differences. Um, and NSF created uh, another, uh, another program, uh, MPS Ascend, um, in 2021. It was, it's now, again, an active solicitation, just Google NSF 23-501, and the solicitation will come up. Um, last year, Siam, um, through a, a generous donation from the Simons Foundation, created um, the Siam Simons Summer Undergraduate Research Program. It ran for the first time uh, this year. It's about um, increasing underrepresented minorities' participation uh, in a summer undergraduate research. It um, just basically duplicates um, the existing program at MAA, um, NREP, um, uh, but sort of ex expands it and sort of concentrates it in specific applied math disciplines. Um, and last, last year, 22, AMS hired the, sort of the first person I'm aware of that whose full-time job at a national organization was to do diversity and inclusion work, and that was Dr. Leona Harris. Um, and then this year, they expanded that, the, the position, so it's now an entire office of diversity and inclusion. Um, oops, that's a little typo. Um, NSF this year has created a new um, solicitation, NSF 23-560. And that is to um, uh, promote um, uh, faculty members who are at um, minority serving institutions, HBCUs, HSIs, tribal colleges, universities, to uh, go to the, one of the NSF-funded math institutes, um, like ISERM, like MSI, sorry, MSRI, SL Math, or um, uh, MC, um, uh, IPAM, our aim, um, and so there are these actions that have been taken to um, help the math community um, broaden participation of people who have different differences. Um, and and I, I'm just talking about the sort of the ones that have sort of cropped up since 2020. There are also ongoing programs, like I mentioned, MAA has NRUP, MAA has the Tensor Summa program as well. Those are those are great, and they should continue. There's Edge. Um, uh, yeah, these are all. Uh, Great. Um, I think that is it. Right. Um, but this is sort of like Lord of the Rings. There's, that's the first ending. Um, I'm going to thank people. Uh, I want to thank Omira Ortega, uh, Ron Mickens, my life partner, Dino Zinga, everyone at MAA, and the audience for your attention, attendance, and empathy. Thank you. Here's some references, and then here's my last ending. If you want, if you want to find my slides, they're always at ron, tinyurl.com, ron-talks.2023. Now I'm really. We have uh, a little bit of time for a question or two. Please use the microphone. Uh-oh. Use the mic, please. Yeah, Professor Buckmeyer, thank you very much for, for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm really happy that you ended here on a positive note, saying about the hopeful things that are happening with various organizations. I wonder if you can say a little bit about um, some of the more distressing things that have happened recently, say, the Supreme Court decision, um, a lot of DEI programs that have come up under fire. Can you maybe say a little bit about your thoughts on the future of some of these DEI efforts in some of our professional societies? Okay, Edre with the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the Supreme Court decision is distressing. Um, I pr presume you're referring to the decision that um, a majority of the court ruled that uh, Race-based affirmative action in college admissions is um, allegedly violates the Equal Protection Act, uh, Equal Protection Clause of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Um, yeah, that is that is troubling. And what's 
it's, I just think of Dickens, you know, we are in the best of times, we are in the worst of times. I mean, simultaneously where this act action is happening positively to broaden participation and um, raise awareness about how we should be inclusive, how we should recognize people have different differences. At the same time, we have people's, we have legislatures passing legislation in states like Florida, states like Texas, saying we do not want an Office of, of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And the message that that sends, so you don't think things should be equitable, you don't want diversity, you, you want to be exclusive, um, it's not clear how we're supposed to interpret that. I mean, I mean that is how, that's how I interpret it, that in those states they do not want that um, happening. Um, my response is, um, regardless of, so for example, so people who, so people in entities and in, for example, uh, the People's Republic of California, where I live, um, uh, affirmative action in college admissions has been against uh, the law due to a state constitutional amendment for at least, I don't know, 10, 20 years. And, but yet, we, um, I think every single Cal State and I think every single UC is still a Hispanic-serving institution, right? The demographics are what the demographics are. And, and so, um, like it or not, um, the... Uh, mathematics community will become more diverse. The question is, will, be, will people be able to thrive and prosper in the mathematics community, not if the way we were doing things or the, or the way we are doing things is going to be the way we will be doing things. So um, I do believe things have to, be, have to change and I do believe there is, um, so I'm more of a half full kind of guy instead of half, half empty. So I do think there are uh, people and champions and uh, who are interested in um, welcoming uh, this change that's going forward. And so that's why I want to end on a hopeful note. And I do think while simultaneously there will be opposition from some quarters, there will also be people working um, in the positive direction as well. Okay, I'm just done the question. Uh, I'll be quick about it. I also want to thank you for that great talk, and I especially appreciate you ending with hope. I, that's great. Thank you for that. My question is more related about the statistics and that we're still not doing a good job in terms of the number of females uh, that were graduating in mathematics. I guess my question is more about our responsibility also to let students know about the scarcity of finding a tenure track job mm. in academia at this point in time. And so, I mean, are we doing a good job? Should we be doing, encouraging people to pursue a PhD in mathematics and go into academia when there's not going to be a tenure track job for them? And could you speak a little bit about our responsibility to that and how, how we can address that a little better? Thank you. I would love to do that, yes. Um, so one, yes, people should be encouraged to do uh, mathematics PhDs. Mathematics is great. Uh, mathematics is one of having more quantitative skills and having a PhD in mathematics is an amazing entree to um, uh, higher career earnings, uh, satisfaction, um, glowing skin. Um, and so yes, people, more people should do math and people should be encouraged to do PhDs in math. Should people be encouraged to go into academia? That is a completely different question. Um, and I do think, um, looking at the data, it has been true for many years now that a small fraction of people who, so we're now up to, I believe, about 2,000 PhDs in mathematics a year. Um, there are not 2,000 tenure track positions that are open every year. Um, in fact, there's some new data analysis in this, um, uh, in the area of metamath that is d looking at exactly at that matching. Um, so no, um, the, we should be, and there's, a, there's this sort of um, feedback loop and mismatch that occurs because um, frankly, y'all who are at PhD, at, math, at uh, departments that grant PhDs in mathematical sciences, you're in academia because that's where you um, prospered and generally that's what um, people in PhD granting institutions know is also academia. 
then most PhD granting, most faculty at PhD granting institutions don't have a perspective on the, I would, sorry to use the term, the real world, um, the, the place, non-academic positions, non-academic careers, non-academic um, pursuits. Um, and so, there's, so the problem is that the, um, the place where people are trained to get PhDs um, often doesn't make it um, clear, make it um, easy, uh, even make it, rec make, make it valued to not pursue um, uh, another career uh, in academia, um, right? They, you you want to make sure that um, when you're in the math gene genealogy project that your advisees will also have advisees um, uh, who, who get PhDs as well. But the positions are just not there. So I, I do think, um, one, making that data available to, p to people early on so that they know, um, yes, uh, some, everyone thinks, oh, I'm going to be the one that's going to uh, change, change the odds, but we're mathematicians, people. <laughs> you can do probability. Um, so it, sh it should be clear that it can't, everyone can't get all the, can't get, ac does not have equal access to all the tenure track jobs. And so uh, making it very clear that that's a rare thing, that other paths are valued. Um, but I do, but uh, again, I'm, again, I'm a half full, hopeful kind of person. I do think um, the world needs more mathematics PhDs. Um, um, I don't think the, the world necessarily needs more mathematics PhDs going into academia. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs>